right along in there, right to the, what would that be, the east of it, right to the east of it. And I, I can't pronounce it right, I'm sure, but it's called Quator. And it's a place, it's not a great big place, but it's a place where Islam is their national religion. It's a place where there is some religious tolerance, but not much. They, if you're a Christian, as long as you keep that to yourself, and you don't do any public worship or public demonstration of it or share your faith with others, then they'll leave you alone. Well, that's better than nothing. Amen. You can't have a church. I think in 2008 they allowed the, uh, Ro the Roman Catholic Church to build a church there. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but anyway. <laughs> but they wouldn't let them have any crosses or no bells or anything like that. No, no Christian symbols whatsoever. So there's some religious tolerance, but just not very much. And what you get, you have to get in private. You say, Brother Billy, what in the world does that have to do with us? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with us. We've had, just recently, this past week, we've been having some listeners from that place on the map. Quatar. And that's, like I said, that's probably not exactly how you pronounce it. But anyway, thank God for that. Amen? Listening to our remnant sermons. And you know, there'll be, there's some remnant people in Quetar. Amen. Yeah, yeah, There's some sir. remnant people in the restricted nations yeah, there is. that are have to worship in private. Yeah. They have to keep their faith to themselves. Amen. Yeah. And thank God that somehow, some way, by His divine intervention, they have found our sermons and our services here at the church and are listening in. And we appreciate that so very, very much. And that just when I when I saw that this morning and I looked up the. Uh, the place there to find out some information on it and to find out what religion that was practiced there and some of the history or whatever. It just thrilled my soul to know that in the restricted nations and the ones that, you know, maybe not completely restricted, but, but they've cracked down on it pretty hard. They're still getting the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. I don't know what kind of Bibles they're allowed to have over there. I'm sure whatever it is, they've probably got it hidden if it's something like what we got here. Amen. But uh, they're hearing the Word of God from us, and I appreciate the Lord doing that. We're talking about the remnant of the Lord have been for three weeks. Now, this will be four weeks in a row. And we started out in the book of beginnings. Actually, we started out with Elijah on Mount Carmel. Whenever, and that's what we've been using as our foundational scripture. That whenever he thought he was all alone, whenever he thought nobody else was worshiping the Lord, the Lord spoke to him and said he had him, was it 7,000 men that had not bowed the knee to Baal, nor had kissed Baal. Amen. And then we found over the book of Romans, years and years later down the road, we found Paul writing to the church there in Rome, and he said, I realize, and it, this is not exact, his exact words, but he's speaking to them. He don't want them to get discouraged and think that God has forsaken His people and that there's nobody left. He said, even in this present time, God has a remnant according to the election of grace. Amen? God, has a, God had a remnant in Elijah's day. He had one in Paul's day. He has one today. Someone told me just this past week, and this is why this is important for us to hear. Someone told me this past week, they said, you know the way things are going, in 15 or 20 years or however far down the road and the way that they're watering down the Word and how hard it's getting to, to hear good preaching, they yeah. said there won't be anybody left. I said, oh, wait a minute. There will be somebody left. Amen. It may not be a big crowd. As we learned in the Word of God, it said that except He had left them a very small remnant, they would have been destroyed. The remnant may be small, but as, since the beginning of time, and we'll find it over in the book of Revelation as well. Today, hopefully, we'll get over there. But we'll find that from the beginning to the end, God has always, will always, have a people, a remnant, somebody that's going to stand up for His name. Somebody that's going to carry on. Somebody said there won't be a King James Version left in 20 years. Oh yeah, there will. There will be because God has always had a remnant. Because He has promised us in the book of Psalms that He will keep His Word. He has preserved His Word from generation to generation. That's what we're doing with it today. I guarantee you, 15 years ago, they said the same thing. You know, in 15 or 20 years, there won't be no kings. Oh yeah, here it is, people, right here. Still got the King James 1611, amen? It'll still be here if the Lord tarries 15 or 20 years from now, 25 or 30 years from now, 40 or 50 years from now, there will still be a remnant of people 
Now granted, each year, each day, each pat, as time goes by, it seems like the remnant gets smaller and smaller. Amen? But nevertheless, there will be a remnant. We found it with Elijah. We found it with Paul. We went to the book of beginnings and we found it over there whenever God had got sick of the sin of man and decided He was going to wipe man off the face of the earth. He finds a remnant in that day. A man by the name of Noah that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. A man by the name of Noah who, Noah who obeyed the voice of the Lord and began work on a boat when it had never rained before. A man that, had, that went against the carnal way of thinking. People would have thought he was, they did think. They thought he was crazy. It hasn't rained. What are you talking about rain? The, the moisture at that time came up from the earth. Read it. It came from the dew. It came from the from from the dew, and it came from the up from the earth, or however it's words there. I can't get it exactly right. But there's never been any rain before. That's what I'm trying to get to you. There's never been any rain before. There's never been a flood before. All that these people knew of. Never been a flood. Here is this man out here in the middle of dry ground, out here in the middle of not even close to the ocean. And he's building an ark. Building a boat. If he was building a small canoe, maybe they could understand. Maybe he's going to pack it over yonder to the sea and go fishing. But he's building one you can't move. He's building one out of gopher wood. He's building one that's so big, and no way you're going to be able to move it. Amen? Maybe they thought, well, what's he building? He building some kind of tires? He building some kind of big multiplex, you know? No, he's building a boat. And when he told them that, no doubt they scratched their head and they ridiculed him. But thank God, he obeyed the voice of the Lord and he built a boat. Not just a boat, but huge. An ark. And on that ark, God saved a remnant of people from His judgment that He poured out. So in Noah's day, there was a remnant. We find that all throughout the Word of God, we've been looking at different people like Daniel and how that in his time whatever they said you will worship the king you will worship the image or you will be cast in the lion's den we find that Daniel stood up as a remnant we talked about the Hebrew children as we do often here my my what men of faith put most of the church world today to shame amen these three men only ones that it says that stood out of the crowd brother Sleece when they said when you hear the music fall down and worship the image that has been set up by the king. And guess what they did? They didn't worship the image. So they stood out like a sore thumb. They said, there's three men that are not worshiping. They're not bowing. So they take these three men, the remnant of that time, of that day, throw them into the fiery furnace, and instead of the fire burning them up, it burns the ropes off of them, and they're walking around in the flames with the Son of God. Why? Because we find a remnant there with the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we've been spending some time these last three weeks looking at how that God has always had a remnant of people. Looking at how that God has always had people that would stand for His name. That would search out the old paths. That would walk in the old ways. That would stand for truth when nobody else would. That would proclaim the name of Jesus when nobody else would. That would proclaim the name of a holy God when nobody else would. That would refuse to bow down to the images of Baal and to the image of, of Nebuchadnezzar and to the image of Dagon and all of the different false gods of that day. They would refuse to. We talked about Moses just a little bit. How the Bible says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and, and, and chose rather to be the deliverer of Israel. Amen? That's what the remnant... We're talking about remnant people. We're talking about people that will stand for Jesus. Amen? We're talking about people that whenever they... We read over there in the book of Joel how that it said to sound the trumpet in Zion and sanctify fast and call a solemn assembly and get all the people together, the old people, the young people, the babies, and let the priests and the ministers, let them weep between the porch and the altar. I told you last week, we need some preachers that don't care to get their hair messed up. Amen? And their clothes a little crinkled. We got preachers now that look like they've been the ones that have been pressed and, and, and sent out there. Amen? And, and starched and pressed and they've got their hair just right and they don't want to get dirty and you can't get a hold of them if you need them because they're too busy and they got too big of a schedule. We need some ministers that can minister to people one-on-one -on -one that don't care to get down at the altar and cry with them and weep with them and pray with them that don't care to put their arms around an old drunk on the street corner and say, Jesus loves you. I'm praying for you. Amen? That don't care to get a little stink on them. Amen? Off of those that don't 
smell just right. They don't look just right. They don't, they don't come from the, the, the right side of the tracks. We need some people who are willing to be ministers and not Hollywood stars. We got enough of that. We got enough of Hollywood stars this morning. Amen. And I ain't talking about Clint Eastwood and all the rest of the boys. I'm talking about the men we have in pulpits across the nation in mega churches that claim to be preachers and ministers of God that are supposed to be pastors. Amen. And it's more like a rock show than it is church. We need some ministers that will weep. That will cry out like Joel said, Spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to a reproach. I told you last week, God don't care what kind of degrees you got on the wall. That doesn't impress Him. It doesn't impress Him. Well, we think it does. We've got denominations that will make you go years before they'll ever allow you to be a licensed preacher. You have to jump through every hoop. You have to start down here. And you get some kind of accreditation, you know, or you get some kind of a card. And then once you've preached a little while and you've studied their notes and you've learned their doctrine, you can move on up the ladder a little bit. Till finally, ten years later, thank God I'm finally licensed to preach. How stupid. If God called you, He will equip you. And your degrees do not impress Him. Amen? Your, your doctorates do not impress Him. Your PhDs do not impress God. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with learning. But you better be careful. The deeper you get into man's way of thinking and the theological things of denominationalism, the farther away a lot of times you get from the truth. And you go into a Bible school and you was, you was, you was right on track. By the time you get out of there, you're a mess. You don't know who's God, who ain't God. That doesn't mess with your mind. You don't know what the Word of God is anymore. You don't know what the true move of the Spirit is. They've already taught you how to have church. Amen? I told them this week, I shared and I shared it with y'all sometime back. It's been a while now, but we got a... We were contacted by someone who called himself a church observer. Maybe you forgot about this. I'll refresh your memory. For $200, Brother Sleese, he would come into your church just as a visitor. Nobody know who he is. And he would sit there and he would observe your service and he would watch how things were conducted and he would watch the people and who's doing what and who's doing, you know. And he would take notes. And after this, he would write a report and submit it to the pastor and let you know what the problems are, who the problems are, what you need to change, and how you need to deal with it all. And all you have to pay him is $200. And it'll make your church services better. It'll make your church stronger. I didn't tell him this. I wish I had him. I don't have his contact information anymore. I would have. We've got people who report to the pastor and don't charge nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't call them church observers. We call them busybodies. Uh, Amen? They all the time saying, this was the problem, that was the problem, this over here is the problem. Anyway, needless to say, we didn't pay him $200 to observe our service and try to tell us what the problems are. But that's the kind of modern day thinking we've got going on. The man's making some money off of somebody. Why? Because they don't know how to go with the leading of the Spirit. The Word of God will teach you what your problems are. This is your mirror. You won't know if your hair's messed up, look in the mirror. You won't know if your face is dirty, look in the mirror. You won't know if you got a spot or a blemish, look in the mirror. Amen? And it'll show you where your problems are. The rim is going to spend some time looking in the mirror. And not the kind where we have our print and 50 hairdos. Amen? I'm talking about the Word of God. And that's what we've been talking about. We're talking about a separated people. A people that are different from the norm. A people that refuse to go along with Rick Warren and the boys and sign a, a treaty, as it were, with the Muslim religion and agree to work side by side for the good of the planet. But don't, never, don't, don't, uh, don't share Jesus with them. Don't try to get them saved. Amen. Well, that's our calling. That's our purpose. That's what we're supposed to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Share Jesus with as many people as you can. We ain't supposed to sign a document saying, no, I won't share Jesus with nobody. So the remnant will refuse that right there. The, review, the, the remnant will be a praying people. We talked about that last week. There will be a people that will pray. 
There will be people like Nehemiah that will get under the burden for the sins of the world and the sins of the church and they will cry out for God to forgive just like those in the book of Joel. Whenever it said let the, the priests and the ministers weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people. Forgive them of their abominations, Lord. Have mercy on them. The rim is going to be the light. Jesus turned to the church of that day and He said, you are, and these words are for you just as much as they were then. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. It's time for the remnant of God, the remnant of the Lord, to be the light she's supposed to be. It's time for the remnant of the Lord to stand for something in these days. Amen? It's time for the remnant of the Lord to go buy chicken on August the 1st from Chick-fil-A. Amen? You heard anything about that? The owner of Chick-fil-A came out and said that their organization was for biblical marriage. Only between a man and a woman. That, that is their faith, that's their belief, that's their conviction. And now you got all the, the, the uh, uh, liberals and the homo movements and all of that crying out against Chick-fil-A because they're, now they're calling them bigots. They're calling them, you know, the radicals. They're refusing to allow them to build some of the restaurants in Chicago and New York. All because... They said they believe the Bible when it talks about marriage. Whatever happened to free speech for everybody? Amen? Oh, you can walk down the street with a sign saying, I'm a homo. Amen? You can go down and proclaim your gay pride. Don't let nobody say nothing against you. But the minute you express your belief in God, in His Word, in His principles, in His commandments, in, the, in, 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 in righteousness, and the way that God says marriage is supposed to be, oh, you're a bigot. You're a racist. Amen. So anyway, on August the 1st, they're promoting this thing for everybody to go buy some chicken and show your support for You don't have to carry a picket sign. You don't have to do no demonstrating. Just go buy some chicken from Chick-fil-A. Amen. And I'm for that. I think it's time that as remnant believers, we stand for what we believe, what the Word of God says. Amen. I think it's time that we quit going with the flow and begin to swim upstream. Amen? I think it's time that we begin to let, instead of hiding our light under a bushel like the Bible says, amen, you know why? Sooner or later, you keep hiding your light and keep it from getting any oxygen. We talked about this before. Your light's going to go out. Amen? It's time that we took our candle and we put it on the candlestick and we let it give light to the house. Amen? And to those that are therein. It's time that we stood for something. It's time that people quit scratching their head and wondering whether you're a Christian or a believer in Jesus, amen, or a follower of Jesus, however you want to word it. It's time people quit trying to decide whether you're a believer, whether you're a non-believer, whether you're a Christian, a saint, or a sinner. It's time for you to take a stand and say, I believe God's Word, amen. I believe what God says. I follow Jesus. It's time for the remnant people to take a stand. And He's going to have a remnant. That's not the question. We're not over here. We're not out here worrying about, oh no, God ain't going to have nobody. Sure He is. He's going to have somebody. But are you going to be one of them? Are you going to be one of them that bows and kisses the images or bows to the false gods of this day and curtails to the, to the New Age church movement that we have? Or are you going to stand for truth? Ain't going to be popular. But it ain't never been popular. Amen? So many people got thrown in the lion's den. So many people got put in the fiery furnace. Amen? Ain't going to be popular. But it's always going to be right. The remnant of God, like Nehemiah, who got under the burden whenever God's people were in such a shape and such a mess. My, my, my. God's always had a remnant. We need some people like David. Oh, he fought and he failed. And he, we always pointing that out. Yeah, but boy, you talk about somebody who knew how to repent. You talk about somebody, he might knew how to fall, but he knew how to get up and go on a little bit farther down the road too. Amen? He didn't give up. He said, Create in me a clean heart, renew with you, renew in me a right spirit before you, God. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He said, Against you and you alone have I sinned. Amen. This is a man that whenever Samuel went to uh, Saul and told Saul the kingdom was being rent from him and the headship of God was being, the anointing was being taken away, he said that he had found him a man that was after his own heart. He was talking about King David. Amen. It's time that the remnant people stood up like the remnant supposed to and 
say we, we're not following the miracles, but the miracle worker. Amen. We're not following the signs and the wonders. Hell, hallelujah. But the signs and the wonders are going to follow us because we're going to walk in truth. We're going to walk in light. And we're going to stand for something in these last days. We're going to take a stand whenever we go to the voting booth. We're going to take a stand whenever we're out amongst the people of the, of the world and they begin to criticize and ridicule or put down our Savior or take God's name in vain. We're not going to allow that to go on without somebody knowing that we don't approve. Really? Brother Chet Darty said one time, if you don't object to it, it's almost like you're giving your approval to it. Amen? It's time we be the light, my goodness, in a world of darkness. The McCamey sung a song years ago. We're not praying to change any hearts. We're just getting used to the dark. Yeah. Amen? Christian lives are wrecked by sin and we blame it on the world we're in. Mm -hmm. We're not praying to change any hearts. We're just getting used to the dark. Mm -hmm. Honey, it's time we took our light out under the bushel. It's time that we quit being like Nicodemus and coming by way of nightfall to the Lord. But it's time that we came out of the closet and proclaimed we are one of His. Amen. I'm a follower of Jesus. Amen. Somebody said, are you Pentecostal? Are you Baptist? Are you Charismatic? Are you Christ Gospel? I'm a follower of Jesus. Amen. I follow His... Oh, my, my, my. I follow His Word. We live, teach, and preach the King James 1611. And all of that points to one man, one Savior, one mediator, one God. That God came in the flesh and that man's name was Jesus Christ. It's time that the remnant... See, God's going to have one. He's going to have a remnant that seeks out the old paths. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Stand in the ways and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And that word paths there means a, tra a, a place where a way has already been made. You know what a path is. You ever been fishing or somewhere and you say, Well, somebody's been down through here. There's a path. Let's go this way. You can either go the path or you can get off the beaten path and you can go where the big weeds and everything else is at. Amen? I've been in places to fish back when I used to fish and had time to fish. I've been in places to fish them old stripper pits and they'd be out in this whole big field of weeds higher than your head. They'd be this tromp down place where somebody had been there going fishing. They done tromp down through there. There's a way that's been made today. Amen. And when he says seek out the old paths and walk therein, there's the good way. Walk in it. You shall find rest for your souls. But they said of that day, they said they would not walk therein. And they suffered the consequence thereof. But those that said they would walk therein, those like over there in the book of Malachi, who even though in a sinful and a wicked perverted generation, the Bible says there were those that thought on His name. There were those who thought on God. And the book of remembrance was written for those that thought on His name. Hallelujah. The book of remembrance was written for the remnant. Amen. That thought upon His name. That still recognized God and still feared and reverenced God. Hallelujah. Seek out the old paths. Walk in the way. What is the way? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. God's going to have a remnant of people that walk the old path, the old way. Amen. The tried and true, the only way. And that is Jesus Christ. There's not many paths to get to God. There's only one way. No I don't care what Oprah says. Amen. I could care less what Oprah says except for the fact that I want her to get saved. Amen. I want her to accept Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. There are not many ways and paths to God. There is only one way. And that way is Jesus Christ. When He died on the cross of Calvary, He said it is finished. The work is done. It's time. Now the work that I came to do is finished. There is a way that's been made for once again man to reconcile with God. And it's not Buddha, it's not Allah, it's not a Catholic priest, it's not Mary. It is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And the remnant church is going to follow that way. According to the election of grace. What is grace? By grace are you saved through faith. Through faith in what? What Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And but one way to enter into this remnant. And but one door. And that is Jesus Christ. On the ark, there was one door that they all went in. And that door was a picture. The, the entire ark really was a picture of Jesus Christ. Amen. Time's running out. The, the, the judgment reigns from God are coming. It's time to get on the ark and the ark being Jesus Christ. Get in the ark. It's getting dark. Amen. Rain's coming. The only way to escape is through the door. That's Jesus Christ. God's going to have some people like those virgins. You remember there were ten of them. Five of them were wise. Five of them were foolish. God's remnant are not going to be caught without any oil. God's women are not going to be caught at midnight when the cry is made without any oil to go in their vessels. You see, in order to be the light 
that it's supposed to be. How many people know that light has to have some type of fuel? A candle has to have something to burn off of. Lamps have to have something for their wick to feed off of, for it to get fuel from, to be able to burn the flame. And that flame is the Holy Spirit. Amen. The God that is Jesus Christ, His presence that has came into your life. Amen. My, my, my. The remnant is going to be the light of the world. I've told you over and over again that the hope for America is the remnant. The hope for the world is the remnant. And I know that people say, well, Jesus is the hope. Yes, He is. But I'm talking about taking that to the world. Jesus could come down and He could sit on a rock in the middle of the town hall, in the middle of the street, and He could proclaim the Gospel. But He didn't. That's not the way He has it set up. When He left, He said, I'm leaving you to be the light of the world. I'm leaving you with the Great Commission to take my message to the world, to every creature, great and small, to everybody that can hear, to everybody you can take it to. He left you to be the applicator for the balm in Gilead. He, he left you. The Bible talks about whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. How can they be saved unless they hear? How can they hear unless a preacher tell them? It's up to the church as a body to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. It's up to the remnant to take the message, not of prosperity, but of Jesus Christ and Him crucified to a lost and dying world. Go with me this morning to the book of Revelation. And we're going to look at the seven churches. I don't know if we'll get through these this morning or not. But we're going to talk about the remnant of the day when John stood there on the Isle of Patmos as he wrote. See, John knew something about remnant. He knew something about standing alone. He knew something about going a little farther than anybody else was willing to go. Out of all the disciples, and I'll say this for the benefit of those out there that are tuning in for the first time, out of all of His followers, out of all of Jesus' followers, we find that when He went to the garden, the disciples followed Him there. And I think maybe He took three of them a little farther with Him, Peter, James, and John, told them to stay there while He went to pray. We find them there with Him in the garden. We find that Peter followed Him to Pilate's hall from afar and watched the judgment. We find that he denied Jesus. Then he went out and wept bitterly whenever Jesus looked at him and he remembered, he realized what he had done. But we don't hear anymore about Peter till after the crucifixion. Once he leaves Pilate's hall with that grief and that sorrow, we don't hear anymore about him till after the crucifixion. We don't hear any more about James until after the crucifixion. We don't hear any more about Thomas until after the crucifixion. But there is one disciple that we hear about at the time of the crucifixion. And that is John the Revelator. As Jesus hangs there suspended between heaven and earth and blood, His last drops of blood coming from His body, the last sweat He had coming from His body, the last strength and breath that He had, He looks down through blood-filled eyes and guess who He sees? He sees his mama and he sees John. The only disciple that followed him all the way to the cross. The only disciple that the Bible notes as following all the way to the cross. And I think that if there was anybody else that would have had it in there, that's pretty important. John at the foot of the cross followed him all the way. So then we find John over here on the Isle of Patmos. He's been exiled. They said he's the only one left, he's the remnant. If we put him out there, surely, surely, he's the remnant of what's left of the disciples anyway, surely it's going to finish him off and it's going to kill that word. My goodness, John would get a revelation on the Isle of Patmos like no man has ever before. Anytime the world or the devil tries to shut up the gospel and tries to kill out God's people, the only thing it causes it to do is spread out a little farther. That's the way it was in the book of Acts. When they began to persecute them, the Bible says they were scattered abroad. But at least they had them. They had them kind of, uh, you know, in, in one spot, one area. But when they begin to persecute them, when they begin to send the torture, they spread out. It went over here, and it went over there, and it went around the nation, carrying the message that Jesus had given. Went around the world, carrying the message that Jesus had given them. So every time the devil thinks I'll stomp it out, they scatter causes it to go farther. He's actually, he, he has actually 
furthered the work of God by his persecution. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Anytime the remnant gets persecuted, it causes the word to spread out a little farther. Go a little farther. Reach some more people. Amen? My goodness. So we find John on the Isle of Pentecost. You know what I think is a couple of interesting facts that I think is interesting here anyway? With these seven churches, only two of these churches did not receive rebuke from the Lord. Which amounts to about 14% of the churches that John wrote to there in the first few chapters of the book of Revelation. About 14%. Is all that were actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Is all that was actually, at least 14% is, is what did not receive rebuke from the Lord in these letters that John wrote. And I got to thinking about that 14%. That might be about right for today's crowd. Out of all of the masses that claim to be Christian, out of all of the churches that claim to be Christian, out of all of the people, they claim to be Christian. Maybe, maybe about 14% of them aren't. Maybe about 14% of the remnant is what makes up the remnant. That's pretty small compared to the whole pie. Amen? That ain't very big. So we find two churches here. Now throughout all these seven churches, we find multiple problems going on in these churches. And I realize that church historians and Bible teachers... They teach that these seven churches, each church represents a different dispensation of the church. And they talk about the first church, and then they'll give you the timeline that that, can, that that was a picture of, the church of Ephesus. And then they'll bring you all the way down to our day, which they call the, church, the day of the church of the Laodiceans, the lukewarm church, the one that makes God sick. Amen? And I realize there is some truth to that, and there's a way to teach that, but I also realize that all of these churches made up the body, as it were, of that of John's day. These churches made up the body of Christ. They made up the body of believers. So really there was a church in Ephesus, there was one in Smyrna, there was one in Pergamos, and so on. But they were all part of the church. Amen? See, we have a church here in Livermore. But this is not the only church. This is just a body of believers that is in this area. As far as the whole goes, the church is made up of the body of believers from all over the world. Not just here in our location. It was the same way in John's day. So there are situations that were going on. There were sins that were taking place in these churches. And it's the first church that he writes to is the church of Ephesus in the second chapter of the book of Revelation. And he says this, Under the, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou cannot bear those, them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. So see, he starts out with these churches telling them the good things, some good points that they had going for them. Some things that they had done, possibly in the past, Brother Sleeves, that were good things. He said, you have, you have born and you have had patience. And for my name's sake, you have labored and has not fainted. Then he stops and says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Then he says, Remember from where you have fallen and repent. He's talking to church people. Repent. Repent. If my people shall call upon my name, and they that are called by my name shall call on me, shall pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. He admonishes the church of Ephesus. You've done some good things in the past, but you've left your first love. We can find that in the church today. People that have left their first love. Jesus is no longer number one in their life. Now today other things have taken His place. Amen? Whether it be sports, whether it be their own family, whether it be the love of money, Different things have taken the place. And His call goes out to this church, Repent! Repent! Come back before you're completely done away with. Before you miss out completely. The next church He talks to is the church of Smyrna. This church is one of the two, only two out of these seven, that were not rebuked. Listen to what He says to the church of Smyrna. And y'all know that song we sing around here? The kids sung it the other night. History tells of Polycarp. A martyr for the gospel's sake. Polycarp was a disciple of John. 
Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. Listen to what God says. To the angel of the church of Smyrna write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead. And I'm in verse 8. Revelation is the second chapter. Who was dead and is alive. I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. You get that? He said, I know your poverty, but really you're rich. My goodness, that flies in the face of the modern day prosperity message as we know it. These were some poor people, but their father owned the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? <laughs> they, were, they were rich when it came to the Lord. And he said, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, that are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things. He's talking about their enemies. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So this is only one of two churches that did not receive rebuke from the Lord. He didn't say you've done this good and this good, but nevertheless, I have this against you because things have changed. The, 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 uh, the, 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 the situation has moved to the wrong side of the tracks, as it were. Something's going wrong here in your relationship with me. So Smyrna could be called a remnant people of that day in the midst of seven churches that had all of these problems to remain faithful to Him, to remain without rebuke. The same goes today. In the midst of a, perverse, of a perverse generation, there are still there is still a remnant of people today that have held on to Him, that refuse to deny His name, and that a crown of life has been laid up for. Now this doesn't mean you have no hope out there if you have forsaken His name, if you've bowed down to other images, if you've taken on the false gods of denominationalism or false religion. You still have a chance today because He says, if you repent... If you'll come back to me, forgiveness is waiting for you. He told the church of Ephesus, remember from where you have fallen. Go back. Do your first works. Repent. Unless I come and remove your candlestick out of its place. The third church he talks to is in the 12th verse, second chapter, is the church of Pergamos. This church he would rebuke for holding the doctrine of Balaam. He would rebuke them for teaching the teachings of eating sac things that were sacrificed to idols and giving their approval to fornication. Amen? And that they had held the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which he hated. So here's a church that he rebukes and he points out all these bad things. But he begins with this. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Even where Satan's seed is, it says, Thou holdest fast to my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days when the tribulation, whenever the, the, uh, the, the persecution was on you. Then he says, But I have a few things against you. And he begins to talk to them about their false doctrine. At one time, you held fast to the faith, but I see you now slipping away into false doctrine. I see you now turning to fables and doctrines of devils instead of the truth. So he rebukes this church. Then the next church is found in verse 18. The church of Thyatira. This church had allowed the spirit of Jezebel to set up in their midst. He says unto the church of Thyatira, write these things, with the, saith the Son of God, who, who, with, who hath his eye like unto a flame of fire, and his feet as unto fine brass. I know thy works, and thy charity, and thy service, and thy faith, and thy patience, and thy works. And the last to be greater or more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So here we find another church that he says you were on the right track, but you strayed. That's where the modern day church is at today. At one time, it didn't matter what church you went into, where you was at, in this country anyway, when the preacher got behind the pulpit, when he opened the book, it was the King James 1611. But she strayed from the truth. She slipped away from the sound doctrines of the Word of God and turned to doctrines 
of devils. The next church we find in chapter 3. This church was the church of Sardis. Listen to what he says about this church. First verse, second, this third chapter. I'm getting ready to close here in a minute. These things saith he that hath seven spirits of God and seven stars. I know thy works, and thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Did you hear that? You have a name of a church that's alive, but you're dead. Reminded me a little bit of the fig tree there that Jesus came upon with His leaves flapping in the wind. It had, a, it had a, an appearance because of the reputation or the way that the fig tree works. First would come the fruit and then would come the leaves. Because it had the leaves, it was supposed to have fruit. But when He got there, there was none. This church was supposed to have life, but they were dead. That's what you find in most churches you go into across this nation today. You think, well, there's a church. Surely they've got hope for me. Surely they've got something I need. I'm miserable as hell itself. I need something from God. I'm going to go to church. And the only thing you find is a bunch of religious people that don't have any more joy than you've got. They've got a name as being alive, but they're dead. We find this today in the church as we know it. Oh, here. The church of Philadelphia. Chapter 3, verse 7. Listen to this. This is part of the remnant he's talking to here. In the midst of these seven churches, this 14%, these two churches that he does not rebuke, this is the second one and the last one. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, that is true. He that hath the key of David. We're fixing to see some of the traits or some of the characteristics of the remnant. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. He tells this church, I set before thee an open door, which no man can shut. For thou hast little strength, but you've kept my word, he tells them, and hast not denied my name. My goodness, hallelujah. Keepers of the word, you haven't denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because they have kept my word with patience. Also, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all of the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. What did I tell you? God's people are not appointed to wrath. We suffer things here now and in, in the beginning of the sorrows, and I don't know how deep into the tribulation it'll go, but we suffer the choices of man in this world. We suffer the things of God. But when God opens up the heavens and begins to pour out His judgment, His people will be spared from that. Amen? That's what He told them. I will keep you in the hour of temptation or tribulation, you might say, that's going to come upon all of the earth. Why? Because you've kept My Word and you have not denied My name. We're talking about a remnant being found in John's day. And i got news for you. In these last days, there is a remnant that will be kept from the tribulation that is coming upon. He said, I've put before you an open door which no man can open. In the next chapter, we find John saying there was a door opened in heaven. And from that time on, Brother Sleece, you never hear anything about the church mentioned. Chew on that a little bit. He tells this remnant church, he said, I've set before you an open door. This church that was a picture of the remnant. I've set before you an open door. Then John says over there in the fourth chapter, I believe, that he saw a door open in heaven. And from that time on, you hear nothing about the church here on earth. Why? Because God has raptured His people to spare them from the judgment to come because then He begins to pour out His wrath upon this earth. And God's people are not appointed to wrath. God is going to protect His people. Whenever He begins to pour out His judgment on the earth by way of rain and flood, what happened to God's remnant? They were took up in an ark and protected from the judgment. Amen. They went through a door and it protected them from judgment. That door was Jesus. The only protection you're going to get 
From the tribulation to come that Jesus said was like no tribulation before nor shall ever be again is to come through the door. The blood wars door. To come through Jesus Christ. To become a part of this remnant that we've been talking about. Those who do not deny His name. Those who keep His word. This is part of the 14% that I was telling you about. My goodness. He said, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Do you hear that? Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. My, my, my. Then he addresses the church, the last church here, that really troubles me the most out of any. Because if you'll notice, with all the other churches that received rebuke, Brother Slice, he started out telling them some good things about them. I know how you've had patience. I know how you've born and I know how you've walked. I know how you, how you have had faith. This is the only church of the churches that he rebuked, the five that he rebuked, this is the only church that he says nothing good about. Think about that. This is the only church that he has nothing good to say about this church. And listen, see if it sounds like anything that's going on today. Under the church of the layout of sins, write this, and this is verse 14, chapter 3. These things saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He tells his church, I'm standing outside the door knocking. If any man will open unto me and let me in, I will sup with him and he with me. But he says, you proclaim to be rich and increased with goods. Do you think it's a coincidence that God saved the Laodicean church for last? When he goes to talking about the prosperity they proclaim as righteousness? Oh, think about it today. We've been there before. We'll go there again, I'm sure, sometime or later. I don't want to go there too much today. But claiming that prosperity is righteousness. we got that going on today. You ain't in God's will if you're poor. You don't have God's best if you're poor. God intends for you to be rich. Does that sound like the major headlines of any of the Christian newspapers today? Some of the, high, some of the best selling books on the New York Times best seller list? Sure it does. Why? Because the church, the spirit of the church of the Laodiceans has infiltrated the modern day church as we know it with the prosperity doctrine that is damning people so to hell because they believe that because they got money, they're okay with God. And this is not an old law. This is not an old teaching. The Jews believed that in Jesus' day. If you were poor, you were cursed. If you were rich, you were blessed. What did Jesus tell that church over here, what was the name of the church? The other one he didn't rebuke, Sardis. No. <clears throat> one of these days I'll be a good preacher. Smyrna. I'll never forget that. He said, I know your poverty, but you are rich. He's talking to poor people. Now listen, I ain't saying you had to be poor to be right with God. But you don't have to be rich to be right with God either. Amen? Yeah. He told the church of Smyrna, I know your poverty, but you're rich. He tells the church of the Laodiceans, I know your richness, but you're poor. Do you get that this morning? Afternoon now, isn't it? Do you get that? I know your poverty, but you're rich. He tells the Laodiceans, I know your richness or your prosperity, but you're poor. You're blind. You're miserable. You're naked. My goodness. Out of this body of believers, 14% is the remnant. 14% had not denied His name. 14% had held on to the faith. 14% had proclaimed His Word and not forsaken it. I don't know what the percentage is today, but that's probably pretty close. Maybe lower than 14%. You're wretched. You're blind. You're miserable. But thank God they still hope. Even this church that he said made him sick, they had forsaken him. 
They had proclaimed another gospel. They had held to the riches of the world. Do you know what he tells them? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and he will sup with I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's what God's been telling us for four weeks. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. There is a remnant. There is a call for people to enter this remnant today. To forsake the idols and the false gods of our modern day church world. And come back to the preaching of the cross. And the blood of the Lamb. To walk in His way and not the ways of man. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and then will I forgive their sins and then will I heal their land. God's calling for His remnant people today to take a stand. He's calling for those that have walked away from truth to come back to the truth. He's calling for those that have denied His name to come back and proclaim His name and to deny the names of the false gods that they have been following. He's calling for those that have put their faith in riches to put their faith in Him. For those that have put their faith in works, to put their faith in Him. He's calling for people to gather together a remnant in these last days in order to bear upon their shoulders the message of Jesus Christ and His hope and His life to a lost and dying world. My Lord. He's going to have a remnant. Are you going to be one of them? He's calling for His remnant to arise. I'm closing to take a stand in these last days, to pray, to seek His face, to come out from the midst of a perverse and wicked generation, to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen? He's calling for somebody to carry the message of hope to the lost and dying. The world has a disease. It is a, it's going rampant. It's like back in the old times whenever you hear, maybe you see it on television, people that had to be quarantined because this plague was spreading and it was killing. That's the way it is today. Sin is the plague. Jesus is the only cure. We hold that antidote in our hands today. It is our responsibility to take it to the sick and to the dying and saying this is the only answer. This is the only hope. His finished work on Calvary's cross. Not religion, not denominationalism, not money, not wealth, not fame, not fortune. Only Jesus and Him crucified. The remnant church will carry the blood-stained banner of the cross of Calvary and proclaim He is the only answer, the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Oh, hallelujah. There's a balm in Gilead today. And that balm is Jesus Christ. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. It's time the remnant light their lamps. It's time the remnant trim their wicks. Fire up the lamp and let the light shine before men so that their Father in heaven might be glorified. I know we covered a lot of surface in just a little bit of time. Hallelujah, but that's all I've got today. Give the Lord a hand for the Word of God. Praise the Lord.